So I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Elizabeth Claire Alberts, and I'm a creative writing tutor and lecturer in creative writing here at Macquarie University. So I recently graduated with a PhD in creative writing uh, just this year in September. That was something I probably never expected that I would do when I was your age, but I'm very glad that I, I did do it because it helped me grow so much as a, as a writer and a researcher. My PhD focused on the contemporary verse novel for children and young adults, which is a hybrid genre that combines poetry and narrative. Now, it's very possible that some of you will um, be familiar with a verse novel. There are many verse novels in Australia. There's um, Stephen Herrick, who's a prolific verse novelist, Catherine Bateson, Margaret Wilde, and there are many, I mean, there are probably hundreds of verse novels in the United States as well. And it, it's written for uh, young adults. They're, for, they're written for young adults. So if you haven't read, the, read any verse novels, I would highly recommend them. Um, they're some of my favorite types of books. And a lot of the stories, they tend to focus on emotional events in the lives of teenage characters. And they draw the reader into the emotional content of the story through poetic text. And it's, it's, the effect is really quite powerful. And um, I, I think the verse novel is also a great genre to read because uh, it will help you understand how to write. It, when you're reading as a writer, if you're interested in writing, it will show you how to create narrative, but also how to create poetry because it combines the two. So doing the PhD at Macquarie University, um, this involved producing both a research component, which was, um, you know, the dissertation part. Um, what we, we call it uh, the critical section of a creative writing PhD. We call it an exegesis. And this was about 50,000 words that I had to do. And then the other section of the PhD was a verse novel, the creative work itself. And I wrote a dystopian young adult verse novel entitled Homing Poems, and it's about a teenage girl named Tegan who wants to be a poet, but she lives in a futuristic society in which poets are banned and poetry is a forbidden activity. So I had a lot of fun writing it, and um, I'm currently looking for a publisher for my verse novel, which can be a very long, arduous process. Um, I always have a bit of a chuckle when I'm talking to people and they hear that I've written a book and they say, oh, so when are you going to get it published? Like, you know, I can schedule it between my dentist appointment and grocery shopping on Saturday morning. So the reality is actually much harder than this. Um, yes, some writers do self-publish and um, self-publishing is a growing phenomenon, but getting your work published by an established publisher takes a lot more time. This isn't to say it's impossible. Um, I'll talk more about this later. So while I have been busy looking for a publisher for my verse novel, I've gotten lots of other things published in the meantime. I've co-authored a children's book with my mother. I've had poetry published in journals such as Island Magazine and um, Yarn Review. I published a lot of creative nonfiction, mainly focusing on environmental and animal rights issues. And um, some magazines I've been published in include Audubon, Alternative Journal, The Great Ocean Quarterly, and many others. And um, I got a lot of different projects on, which is quite normal for, for a writer. Um, one of the other projects that I'm doing is a podcast series called Earth Voice Podcast, which is all about giving people and organizations who work on the front lines of environmentalism and animal rights a voice. So today's talk is about how we find our ideas for creative work and, uh, and how we turn those ideas into stories and poems and any kind of other creative text that you want to create. So it's important to remember that every poem, every fictional story that you read started with an idea. The writer may have based the story or poem on their own experiences, the experiences of others, 
or perhaps they were inspired by some kind of visual stimulus like a painting or drawing or object of some kind. So here are a few ideas up on the PowerPoint of, of places where we can, we can get ideas for creative writing. Another really great place is, is newspaper articles. So many, um, a lot of the, a lot of these um, story starters, they might seem to arrive outside of the process itself or prior to it, which seems to reinforce that idea that we, that we look for inspiration or even that inspiration may find us. Um, but it's very interesting to, to think about and to practice how the act of writing itself can actually create ideas. So for instance, when you create a word pool, which is just, you know, I'll show you an example of a word pool. This is one that my students did in class. I always do this exercise um, for my introductory creative writing class, and I get the students to go up on the board, and we put up our favorite words, color words, verbs, nouns, foreign words, really anything. We just have a lot of fun in the beginning. And then I tell them to sit down and um, start playing with combinations of, of words. It could be as simple as combining uh, a couple words together, um, and or, or, or if, a, if a text starts to emerge, I tell them to, to go with it uh, and to explore where that takes them. And um, I've had, and, and my class has come up with some amazing poems and also fictional stories based on these word pools. So with this idea, you don't even need, um, you know, outside inspiration. You can just start with words, create your own word pool and see what comes out of that. And that, to me, is a very exciting possibility. So another technique that um, can start the writing process, and this is a personal favorite of mine, is free writing. Or you might, uh, you might have heard of it, free writing, or it's also been called fast flow writing. This involves putting pen to paper and writing whatever pops into your head and writing as fast as you can. So free writing is actually how I found my own way into creative writing when I, when I decided I, I wanted to be a writer. I'll just tell you a little bit more about that. Um, much of what I learned to write I, or how I learned to write um, was um, what I learned in university. So as an undergraduate, I didn't, I didn't study writing, but I studied theater and I took some playwriting classes and that is what um, sparked my interest in writing and my supervisor had encouraged me to pursue it. So I went on to get a master's, a master of arts in creative writing here at Macquarie and eventually the PhD. But before I studied, studied creative writing at university, my mother, Nancy Markham Alberts, she acted as my first writing teacher. I was pretty lucky um, to have a mother who was a published children's author. And when I was growing up in the United States, I often tagged along with her on her writing, uh, when she went to her writing group, and her manuscripts were my bedtime stories. So I, I was very um, aware of the process that writers have to go through, the rewriting and the rewriting. And I saw you know, her novels evolve over, over years, and it was... I probably didn't appreciate it as much until I became a writer myself. And looking back on it, I think, well, that was a wonderful experience. Um, but I also adored reading. And this is where, you know, you don't need a published author as, for a mother. You can just read. And that is very important if, if you want to be a writer. It just, and I know some, I've come across students who say, well, I don't like to read, you know, but I want to write. Well, I think you still need to try to search out, you still need to try to find stories that you're interested in. So, so keep with it. Look, look for stories. Use your school library and, and read as much as you can because that, that is also an amazing teacher. And if I hadn't read as much as I had, then I, I don't think I, I would be a writer. So... I, Going back to my mother, um, my people often ask me, did you always want to be a writer because of your mom? And my answer was no. In fact, probably like some kids, I wanted to be anything but what my mother was. And I tried doing lots of other things. And um, but, you know, when I was in my 20s, um, I had lived a little bit and I started to think about some stories that I wanted to write and I, I was away in, in university, but I remember calling my mother and telling her this. And as you can imagine, she was, she was quite excited. 
so I, I set out to write. I opened up a notebook and um, I, I really had no idea where to start. Like, I think I, I would write, I would start like a few lines, opening lines to a story, like great lines and maybe a page and then it would just stop. Um, and, and that was the cycle that I was going through for quite a long time. Um, so my... Um, so yeah, there's the idea of the of the blank page. Okay, so I just got some quotes from authors who are talking about the blank page. Okay, Jennifer Gilmore talks about what is it about the blank page that makes me want to hurl myself into a game of solitaire? I ask myself these kinds of questions while I'm playing solitaire. So the blank page is incredibly intimidating, um, and the best way to get past it is really quite simple. It's just to fill up those pages with writing. Well, maybe that doesn't sound as simple as I've made out, but I'll, I'll give you a great technique to, um, to fill out those pages. So, so it's the free writing. We're going back to the free writing. And it was my mother suggested this book uh, that I get called Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. And this is a fantastic book for beginning writers, and it's filled with exercises and different approaches that you can take uh, to, to enter creative writing. And uh, perhaps your school libraries will want to, want to look into getting this if, if you don't have it already. So Goldberg sets out these rules for creative writing. Now, I say rules because uh, part of the idea of creative writing, uh, of free writing, is there are no rules, but she does have some. And one of them is to keep your hand moving. That means don't stop at all. You're not stopping and thinking, you're just moving. Uh, don't cross out words. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation, grammar. Lose control. So let your thoughts just, you know, take you somewhere. Don't think. Don't get logical. And go for the jugular. So that just, just be as, you know, aggressive with the writing process if, as you want so I'll just show you, um, so, so with, with the, uh, writing, the free writing process, you can, you can have a prompt. Um, Natalie Goldberg sets out a few prompts in writing down the bones, such as, um, you know, writing about a particular event in your childhood, for instance. But you don't necessarily need to have a prompt to, to start free writing. And another rule of mine with free writing is that if you don't know what to write, just write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, over and over until something happens. And I promise you, it will happen. So I just wanted to give you, show you what free writing might look like. Now I recommend doing free writing on with pen and paper. That's just the way I think. Um, but in this age of computers, I know a lot of people can just type on their laptops. So this is, a, this is actually was published in Janet Barraway's book, Writing Fiction. And she shows an example of what her free writing looked like. So as you can see, it's full of typos, it's full of you know, misspellings, um, grammatical errors, and it doesn't really even make sense. And she's being very reflective in the beginning. She's wondering, thinking about her writing process. But she talks about how you know, she came up with, you see the detail at the end. She starts talking about the grandma's house and you know, the grass out the window and the dog rolling and the pie tin or the tin pie, <laughs> she said the words are all jumbled up, but that gave her something, you know, a, a kind of image for her to create something and to go on. And, and that's usually what comes out of these kinds of exercises. So with free writing, you might have an idea, you might get an idea for a character or a setting, a particular feeling, um, some kind of image. And all of these things are great uh, starting points for creative writing. And besides idea generation, which is a fantastic aspect of free writing, um, it's and those and those first thoughts are incredibly powerful. You know, when you're not judging yourself, you're not editing yourself, you're just letting it all come out. And Natalie Goldberg talks about that, about the power of first thoughts that come out of free writing. Um, so it's, but it also just shows you, look, I can fill up a page. 
I have filled up uh, two pages or three pages. And you can do these, these exercises for as long as you want. So you might want to you know, spend 10 minutes. You might want to spend 20 minutes. I mean, your hand starts to hurt after a while if you're writing, 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 writing. But it, it does give you the confidence um, that you can write and you can fill in those pages. And I also, uh, you know, fr free writing is a fantastic way to write about things that you know or to remember things in your past. And many of my students have also said it, it's very therapeutic as well. So at the same time, creative writing isn't and, and definitely shouldn't be limited to your own experiences. Writers are often told that you have to write what you know. And there, you know, this saying does have a valid point, uh, write what you know, because it's easier to write about things that you, you know, you've experienced, you know, your personal experiences at school, your neighborhood, your hometown, your family. But with creative writing, you have the freedom to go wherever you want to in your writing. You can explore the lives of other characters, create new worlds, rewrite history. They say that writers live twice and when you, you know, if you, if you want to rewrite a incident in your own personal history, and you can do that, you can live twice, you can live something a different way. So I think a more appropriate quote, instead of thinking about writing what we know or even writing what we don't know, which is another thing that's said about writing, um, write about what you don't know about what you know. And this is a quote by Grace Paley, who's, um, and, and I, I think it's, it's a, this quote is great because it encourages this active exploration of the unknown. And it allows you to explore whatever interests you as a writer. And you, you know, you might be exploring something you know, but you will also be exploring the unknown. And you might discover things about yourself that you had never thought about before. And you can also explore other characters' um, experiences through, through this idea. I mean, I might want to write a fictional story about a stuntman who gets injured on a Hollywood set. Now, I have never been a stuntman, or I guess I should say stuntwoman, um, but, you know, and I've never had a bad injury, pretend maybe had a motorcycle accident. Um, but, you know, I, I might use my own experiences or my own memories of what it felt to be to be sick or to be uh, maybe maybe he got down you know maybe he became very depressed because he couldn't do his work and I might use my own feelings of sadness to explore what this um, stuntman went through and and through this process you you might discover parts of yourself that that you never knew were there so let's say you've you found your idea for your for your story. Now you want to shape it into a piece of creative text. So when you're writing a fictional story, you're, you're going to want to use different narrative elements. And I also wanted to say that um, this talk tends to be focused more on narrative, but this absolutely incorporates poetry as well, especially narrative poetry. And um, so you can use all of these same skills when writing poems. Um, so what is narrative exactly? So a definition of narrative could be a perceived sequence of sequential um, connected events. All right. So in terms of structure, this is about giving your, your piece of writing a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you don't, but you don't necessarily need to present events exactly as uh, they happened. You know, you can have some time shift. Now, another important aspect of narrative is the idea that there needs to be conflict and complication. In other words, something needs to happen. All right, so perhaps you're very familiar with this because when you've done writing in school. All right, but, but sometimes, you know, beginning writers struggle with, you know, what kind of conflict. Um, sometimes the, the complication may not be um, significant enough. Other times it might be uh, too dramatic. Like you don't have to have, um, you know, death or a zombie apocalypse to create an interesting story. Although I, I'm not saying that you can't write about those things, but it can be more more subtle. Um, 
but but before we, you know, it, it's you might have an idea for a a narrative and and an incident of what's going to happen, but this is very closely connected to character. Okay, so character is key. You have to know who your characters are. How do we develop our characters? You could base them on people you know, your family members, your friends, your classmates, also people you don't know. I um, take a lot of public transport. I'm on the train and bus a lot, and I love people watching. And sometimes if I see a really interesting person, or they're doing something interesting, I might take out a little notebook and, and write, a, write a few notes about them. So I encourage you to do that as well, you know, just... just uh, document what you see and, and the world around you. So I, I um, so it could be people we know, people we don't know, but we can also write about ourselves. And I, I think that we always, um, we always put ourselves into our writing in some ways. And we have many different selves. The self that we are when we're in school, the self we are when we're uh, babysitting a younger sibling. You just need to make sure that your character is interesting in some way. When I say interesting, I don't mean that they have to be eccentric or incredibly talented, although there could be, you know, they, they could be, but they could just be quite ordinary. It's just, uh, there might be something, <clears throat> you know, a, a voice that, that, comes, that comes through in your writing, or you might find it interesting about the way they comb their hair or why they like ice cream for breakfast. <clears throat> Now, this, that said, characters, they just don't walk straight onto the pages, fully formed. We get to know them through our writing, and we develop them through our writing. A lot of this can be done as a, through a pre-writing stage. You can write short biographies or get pictures of your characters. <clears throat> you might also want to interview your character, you know, put them on the psychologist's couch and, and find out what, what they have to say. And in terms of interviewing, you can also interview real people. And, um, you know, if, if you're trying to <clears throat> write from the point of view of a medical doctor, you, you know, you might want to see if a medical doctor will talk to you and ask them questions about, about what they do and, and how they think and feel about things. And it's, uh, you, you'd, it's, it's, interviewing is a wonderful skill to learn, and it's always amazing what people will tell you. So, but a lot of, of what happens with character or, or how we develop characters happens through, um, you know, the writing itself. And, and I think it's very important to show your characters in action. Have them do something, okay? So I, I've just put a few examples here. You know, she hurled her biology book into her cracked leather handbag. Um, that is showing us that, you know, she's angry. And that... You know, that, that's going into the idea of that I'm showing you that she's angry. I'm not telling you she's angry. But that gives us a very good idea of what that character is like. Um, now, there is that saying in, in creative writing, you know, show, don't tell. And um, writers definitely do a fair amount of telling as well as showing. But in many instances, it is more powerful to show. And we can show through the use of powerful detail, um, active verbs, dialogue, action, um, interior monologue. And it's always another excellent skill in, in creative writing is to always try to, is to try to be as specific as you can. You know, if you say a street, don't say, just don't say the street, say Elizabeth Street. Or say, instead of a tree, say the ghost gum. Instead of a bird, um, you know, Tell us it's, the ma it's a magpie. And these kinds of details are what um, creates the story world and what will interest your readers and you as the writer. So going back to that uh, relationship between character and conflict. So there needs to be a problem that needs, uh, that needs to be worked out by the end of the story. And again, the conflict doesn't have to be dramatic. Or physical and uh, you know conflict in ordinary situations are often much more fascinating um, so think about conflicts that you experience every day disagreements with your family members or friends difficulties at school various decisions you make every day that may form a conflict inside of you 
If you're not sure what to create, play the what if game. What if my character saw a friend cheating on an exam? What if um, their parents told them that uh, they had to get rid of their beloved pet? And within your story, something needs to change. And again, this can be subtle. This can be just a realization of some kind or um, some, some, you know, something coming to a head, something being answered. And character is, is wrapped up with this, okay? So character cannot be separated from plot. And you have to think about your character wanting something and wanting it very badly. And they have to be the one driving the action or driving the story through a series of events. Um, don't let your characters be passive participants, letting things happen to them. They should be the ones making things happen, okay? So sometimes when I'm writing and I'm trying to focus on what my character wants, I will just write on a piece of paper. My story is about, I'll say my character's name, Tegan, and she wants this, and she will do anything to try to get it. And I use that to help me, uh, to, to remind myself of, of what the story is about. So other things that you should consider when you are um, writing your story is, is focalization choices and, and point of view. That means, you know, whether it's, it's first person or third person, and if you're shifting point of view between two different characters, that's a very important decision you need to make in your, in your writing. Um, you know, because a story that's written in first person is going to be a very different kind of story than um, a story in third person. So if, if your character really wants to speak, if their voice really wants to come through, try writing in first person. Um, but if you're interested in shifting point of view between a couple different characters, then, then you might want to try third person. Setting. Every story takes place somewhere. So you need to think about how to um, draw the reader into, into the setting and help them experience this. And setting is a lot more than what a place looks like. It's what a place smells like and sounds like, even tastes like, okay? So try to use rich sensory detail when you're describing setting. Dialogue. Again, this is a very, um, this is where eavesdropping really helps, okay? So when you're on the train or bus or in any kind of public place, listen to the way people talk. And it helps you to understand how, how we tend to speak in fragments, how we tend to interrupt each other. Um, and, and there, you know, there's lots of different um, things to think about. There, there's, another thing is that we often don't, address each other by name, especially if we're, if we're looking at another person while we're speaking. Um, we also don't usually say what we want very directly, although some people are very direct, but the majority of people might say something a little bit more indirectly to try to be polite, and that can create a, quite an interesting effect on the page. So you want to look at your dialogue and also time shift as well. So even the simplest stories, they tend to involve some kind of time shift, um, you know, going back in time, some kind of flashback, what we call analepsis, um, or, or going forward in time. Now, if you're feeling overwhelmed with all these different things that you need to consider in your work, you know, point of view, setting, dialogue, you know, you can just look at you can just write it all out like you have done with your free writing it's as quickly as you can. Get that first draft down. And I, I would also recommend writing short stories. Don't try to, to write the great Australian novel uh, as your first thing, like I was trying when I first began writing. Concentrate on writing a short story and get it all down. And then when you go back and you start revising and reworking, then you can think about, okay, and this time I'm just going to look at setting. And the next draft I'm going to look at my character development. So they say that writing is rewriting, and I, I do think this is very true. Um, it is, you know, it can be a very long process. Uh, my mother would look at published books that um, on, on the bookshelf in, in the bookstore, and she would still want to change things in her books. So in some ways, the, the process never really stops. Um, but I take a lot of comfort in this. 
I, I know some, some, sometimes it's like, oh, I don't want to rewrite this. Isn't it good the first time? But for me, it's, it's so comforting to know that I don't need to be perfect my first time. I can be as messy as I want. I can write as badly as I want. No one's going to see it. I don't show anyone my first drafts. I always show people my third, fourth draft. And I know that once uh, something's down, it becomes easier to rework it and rewrite it. Um, and, and if you do find yourself stuck, which sometimes uh, happens, you can go back to those story starting techniques that I covered, the free writing, the word pooling, and you'll see that you do have the power to fill in page after page after page. Um, another thing my mother always said to me was that she never believed in writer's block. She said it was writer's laziness, okay? So she said it was always something that you could do to work through it. Um, and, you know, sometimes it would just be as simple as taking a walk. And there's actually uh, scientific research showing that walking does help stimulate the imagination. And I find that it, it really works for me. Um, feedback is also fantastic and, and it's very valuable um you know you, you you show it to your friends show it to your family but you want them to say more than oh it's great you know it, it's good to get praise um that but at the same time you want people to um comment on the narrative was everything clear how was the language what about the point of view choices and critique groups and university are, are a very big part of what we do okay so all the students are actively giving feedback to one another. And back to what I said before, it was read as much as you can because you can have all of these teachers, all of the authors who have published books can be your teachers. Read, see how they do it, and you will um, absorb it on a somewhat subconscious level. I just wanted to quickly point out a couple of um, places where you could submit work. Um, there is Voice Works, which is an Australian journal um, that publishes young Australian work. Um, also, Yarn Review. I've actually published work in there, but as an adult writer, but they, they do publish um, young adult fiction and poetry as well. So I think it's great practice to get your work out there and to, to try to, you know, submit. Now, you're not always going to be, uh, you're not always going to be accepted. Sometimes you will get rejections. And I don't want you to feel discouraged because it, it, it happens to everyone. My mother used to say she could wallpaper a house with a number of rejection letters that she got. Now, what I have up on the screen there is actually a picture of some of my mother's rejection letters that I put up on the wall. I found 81 of them, okay? And this picture doesn't even show all of them. But yeah, it wasn't really um, a house that she could wallpaper, but it was, it was quite a lot. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of fun going through them and, and to show, show the process that she went through and, and the work she went through. She was very persistent, you know. She got a rejection. She might rework things. She sent it out again. She got a rejection. She sent it out again. Um, but, you know, she, she, this is not telling you to discourage. I'm not telling you this to discourage you. I'm telling this to, um, to galvanize you. So it's, you know, she did end up publishing a few books. Okay, so this is, this is what happened when she just persevered. I was just going to leave you with a, uh, an exercise that you could possibly do after, after the talk. And that's to write, so here, here are some paintings. Um, and I, I want you to write from the point of view of one of these characters for 10 minutes. And when your time is up, you can brainstorm with a partner about how you could develop your idea into a short story or narrative poem. And based on the idea you developed from the painting uh, writing exercise, write an entire story or narrative poem in 500 words. Now that's not a lot of words, okay? But it'll help you learn how to get all those story elements into a, a small text. And make sure something significant happens, some kind of conflict or a complication. Think about how it will change by the end of the story. Oh, think about what will change by the end of the story. And if you have time in class, perhaps you can also critique each other's work. And when you do that, you want to give praise and then give suggestions. And that's, uh, it, it's a valuable learning process. The last piece of advice I wanted to leave, uh, leave with you was just to, just to write, okay? That is the best way for you to learn. So don't wait for me to tell you, just start writing. Thank you. You know, 
I, I wasn't um, actively trying to mimic a dystopian uh, features in other texts, but at the same time, it draws on different, um, you know, the idea of creating a, a story world that um, in which a government perhaps is taking taken over. Um, I, I just, for me, it, the the thing that I think made my book very different was because I was writing in in poetry, um, and I was I was concentrating on my my character's voice. I, I wasn't necessarily thinking, well, how can I make this dystopian? I, I was thinking more about my my character, my character Tegan, and what she wanted and, and needed, and and that's. Um, I think that's what you should be focusing on. Instead of thinking about plot or uh, generic convention, think about, think about character. I have co-authored a um, children's book with my mother and called Joselina Piggy Cleans Her Room. Um, and I've also contributed to a, a book called Stories of the Great Turning. Um, still looking for a publisher for my verse novel, but I'll be sure to let you know if it, if it does get published. <laughs> the most exciting thing about writing. Um, well, I think I could probably answer that in a couple different ways, but I think the the most exciting part about writing is is just the exhilaration you feel when you create something new or when you're able to capture a, an experience that you had or that you want to write about or, or, or express some feelings that you had on, on the page. And I think there's also, it's very rewarding when you can finish a project. You know, when, when I start Sometimes when I have assignments, you know, I do a lot of journalism and I have a deadline and it's two days away and I haven't done it yet. And the first day I'm trying to write and I panic and I think, oh gosh, I have to tell them I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm a failed writer. And I go through this every single time and you think I'd learn, but it's such, it's so rewarding to just keep on it and to end up with something that is finished or you know, finished to 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 an extent, and um, and, and to see it published, that that's that's an amazing that that's the most exciting experience for me. Absolutely, that's and that's a fantastic way to develop characters is to put them in different situations and. Um, and to, yeah, to see how they react, act and react to different things. And you do think about them a lot. And, and, and what I talked about before, a lot of that, um, those exercises like writing biographies or interviewing them or <clears throat> just spending time with them. So sometimes it's nice to just spend a day, an entire day with your character that you're trying to create and think about all the different things that your character would do. And a lot of that is thinking about it, but it's also, you can think through the writing process itself. I don't um, necessarily wait for inspiration to find me. I, I just, um, I, I go out and make it. So if I, I, I knew I wanted to write about things and I am very passionate about um, environmental issues and animal rights issues. And I'll just, um, I'll look for stories myself. I, I don't necessarily wait for the story to find me. My favorite authors. Okay, well, I just spent four years in a creative writing PhD where I read a lot of verse novels. And I have to say, um, this is just the verse novel genre. I absolutely adore Sonia Sones, who's an American verse novelist. Um, Stephen Herrick is wonderful. He's an Australian author. Perhaps uh, some of his books will be at your, at your library. Um, Stephen Herrick, Sonia Sones. Oh, I don't know. There's just so many. It, it's like choosing a favorite child, isn't it? So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for listening.